Mark chapter 10. We'll look at verses 32 through 45 this morning. So I've lived in Greenville uh, for about a little over 10 years. And before I moved here, I knew ECU football was a big deal. I'd been to one game prior to living here when I was a kid. Um, but it wasn't until I started, I lived here, I started going to games regularly. I didn't realize like how out of the loop I was because of the amount of fanfare that happens at ECU games. Um, as I realized this, like ECU is a huge, ECU football is a huge part of not just the campus, but this community. And so here's some things that like sort of would, were jarring to me uh, the first time I started going to games. Uh, first of all, you're, you're there and they do all the team introductions and then all of a sudden there's like a Jimi Hendrix song that plays. And out of this wooden pirate ship, th- we had a wooden pirate ship when I first moved here, and the team would run out in this purple mist and the Jimi Hendrix song would play. And before the, the team would come out, there's a, a, a real pirate with swords who comes out and then the team follows this, this pirate. And then there's another pirate, Petey the pirate. So it's confusing on like which one is actually the mascot um, and so that threw me off. And then, then throughout the game, there's all these different little chants. There's people that yell purple, and then the other side has to say gold. And then we have the whole, we are the pirates of ECU. Hey, and then we do that. And then there's, uh, after every touchdown, there's a cannon that, sh- that blows, which is kind of shocking if you, it goes off. It's kind of shocking if this is your first time there. You have no, you're just like, oh, touchdown, bam. And you're, like, you're thrown off. And so that happens. And then there's like, at the end, there's a no quarter flag. So I was like, so they don't do a fourth quarter? Like what happened? I didn't know what this was. And so all this unique fanfare, not to mention there's a Kira Knightley clip from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean where she tells you to hoist the colors. There's a whole other flag that goes up there. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And even after the game, there's, oh, there's, there's blackout games, there's painted purple games. And it's like all of these different things that you kind of have to keep up with. And, and honestly, if you, if you don't know at all what I'm talking about, it means you have not been here very long. It means that you need to catch up because I learned that when you know all of these things and you start to learn them and what they mean, you become a a better citizen of Greenville (laughs) because it kind of makes up who we are as a community. Now, I tell you that because when it comes to Christianity, the, the faith that we hold, there's sort of, we have our own sort of fanfare. We have our own little things that we do, and if we don't know why we do them, it can be kind of confusing. It can be really confusing if this is kind of your first time kind of walking into a church or understanding what uh, the Christian faith is all about. Like, for instance, no one questioned the fact that we all walked in and started singing. Like, okay, stand, and then we go through all these songs, and all of us have all these different ways that we sing. Some of us lift our hands, and we sing louder. Some of us don't lift our hands, and we sing quietly. Some of us close our eyes. Some of us just read the words. Some of us just do the coffee thing. Some of us kind of nod back and forth. Some of us move sideways, and we all do, some of us shout, and all of those things are okay, and those are your expressions of the way that you respond, but that's kind of one of the things that you do. It's also, like, that we read out of the same book every single, every single time we come together. That's another thing that we do. Another thing that we have, we have this cross. This is a, a torturing device that no one says, oh, that's a torturing device. No, we said that's a cross. But it's a symbol of something that we have. We have baptism. And don't you think that's strange? That like if somebody becomes a believer, then we say, let's put them in a big old tub of water and dunk them. And then they come back up, everyone should clap. Like, we do that. Like, when did that become, like, when did we start doing that? So what does that mean? Uh, How about communion? Isn't that odd that we take bread every single week and we say this reminds us of uh, the physical body of a human that once lived on this earth, and we actually take the bread and we dip it in the cup, and the cup reminds us of the blood that 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 person shed for us. Isn't that strange? I remember the first time I went to a church, I was totally thrown off by what communion was. I was about eight years old. I went to church with my, my parents, and I remember seeing in the front, they had communion set up, and I didn't know it was communion. I just saw a table with a cloth over it, and I knew there was stuff under the cloth. It seemed like there was something under the cloth, and I was like, um, and then I thought, that's a, that, that's a dead body. I remember thinking, I was eight years old, I thought that was a dead body. Well, what became more confusing is after the pastor preached, he got down and said, now we're going to serve the body. 
And I was like, wait, wait, the serpent, that body is going to be like cut up and served. Like I didn't, I was like, dad, what's happening? He said, no, we're the body. I'm like, wait, 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 that's the body. Wait, wait, what's happening here? What's happening? So it can be very confusing and very kind of, kind of jarring if we don't understand what's happening. And not only that, if you've been a Christian before and you've done these things, but you don't know why, what I want to, what I want to tell you this morning is when we understand what these symbols and what these rituals mean, when we understand the biblical significance of them, my, my, my hope is that we will become better worshipers of King Jesus. And that's my goal this morning. That's what I want us to see. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, uses these phrases over and over again of things that we celebrate today. Jesus uses, he refers to the cup, uh, talking about the cup of communion, but he uses it in different ways at different times. Jesus refers to baptism different times. He's not just talking about physical baptism. He he's also often uses the cup or baptism as a metaphor. And so what is it that Jesus means? Because the reason why the church practices these things, the early church practices these things, and now 2,000 plus years later, we're practicing these things. Why do we do that? Why do we borrow these phrases from Jesus and practice them today. So if, if we borrowed them from Jesus, it's important that we know what Jesus meant when he said them. So that's what my hope is that we'll see in God's word this morning. We'll start in Mark chapter 10. We'll look at verse 32. It says, and they, and this is referring to Jesus and a small crowd of people, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Now, Jesus is here with his disciples in a crowd, and they're traveling to Jerusalem. And Mark shows us the emotions of the crowd, the mixed emotions. He says, there's some who are afraid, and there's some who are amazed. Now, Jesus going to Jerusalem represented something. It represented for the, the, the crowd and the disciples, many of them thought, well, this is Jesus' time to set up a political uh, system to set up a political kingdom when in fact Jesus was going to die. Either way, they knew that this was a dangerous mission to Jerusalem. And so some were amazed because they thought, wow, Jesus is really brave. Some were afraid because of th they thought what would happen to Jesus and what could possibly happen to them. Now, then it goes on in the second part of verse 32. It says, and taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. So this is, in Mark's gospel, the third prediction of Jesus' death. Each time that Jesus tells his disciples he's going to die, he gets more and more intense and more and more explicit. Jesus is saying, this is going to happen. And then you have amazement and fear that's happening among the crowd. And I'm assuming this crowd is much smaller because of the, the danger of going into Jerusalem. And then right in the midst of it, you have two disciples of Jesus come to Jesus and they ask ask him a pretty boneheaded question. Look at 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. Now, I don't know how many in this room are parents, but that's a trick. That's called manipulation, okay? It's like your, your kids, they come up to you and they say, Mom and dad, I have something to tell you, but, but before I tell you, can you promise me that you won't get mad? Like, no, you can't ever agree to that. That would be insane. Same thing with you. We, we want you to give you whatever we ask. Now, Jesus is smart. He doesn't fall for it. So what does he say in verse 36? He said to them, what do you want me, me to do for you? So he doesn't agree. He says, let me, let me ask you first. And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right and one on your left in your glory. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't fall for this trap? What are they asking? Well, it's almost like they, they're not hearing Jesus, 
or they're not taking him seriously of what he just said, of how he's going to die. They are still under the false assumption that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to set up his political kingdom. And so they're confused, even though he keeps saying it over and over, go, no, I'm going to die. I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to resurrect. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but when we get here, aren't, aren't you going to set up your kingdom? And aren't we going to be like the top dogs? Aren't we going to be on your right and the left? The right is at the highest honor of the throne. The left is the second highest. He's like, I know we got 12 of us here, but the, can you just go ahead and tell us like which one of the top two? Can you just go ahead and let us know ahead of time so we can, we can go ahead and establish this thing? It's confusing, right? He keeps saying it over and over, and they just don't get it. So I know Jesus is really a pastor. He keeps saying the same thing, and no one gets it, right? I heard that somebody said that a pastor, when he's preaching to his congregation, it takes the congregation 12 times to hear the same thing until they actually hear it. This is why when I I preach and I go on vacation, I bring in guest speaker, and they're like, man, that one point he made, I've never thought about that before. I'm like, are you kidding? I've said that 10 times. I actually texted that guy that, and that's why he said it. Like, I'm the one, you know, like, but praise God, it was heard. You know, that's what you have to listen. You're the pastor. And this is what Jesus is dealing with. Three times I've made this point, and each time more emphatically than the last Three times I've said that this time it's going to happen in Jerusalem. I've said, I'm going to be mocked. I'm actually going to be spit on. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be killed. And they still don't get it. But here's how Jesus responds. Jesus says in verse 38, he said, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. And they said to him, and I love this, we're able. Really, just like that. You're able, right? Well, clearly, the disciples don't understand what Jesus means when he says, are you able to drink the cup or be baptized with my baptism? So let me explain what Jesus means. Well, when he talks about the cup, The cup was a symbol throughout the Old Testament as the wrath of God. Isaiah, for instance, Isaiah 51, verse 17, Isaiah says, Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, old Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord. What does he say? The cup of your wrath. Verse 22, dip down in 22, the Lord your God who pleads the calls for his people be uh, Behold, I have taken from you the hand, the hand, uh, from your hand, the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath. You shall drink no more. Both times, Isaiah ties in the cup with the wrath of God. The prophet Jeremiah does the same thing. Jeremiah twenty-five fifteen, the Lord of Israel said to me, "Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make." all the nations to whom I will send you to drink. So the cup was a symbol of God's wrath being poured out upon mankind for its sin. So oftentimes in the, in the old Testament, the wrath of God would be poured out upon sinful nations and they would be eliminated. And so he was called, I'm going to pour out my wrath. I'm going to pour out the cup of my wrath upon you. Even Jesus on the cross, or Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, rather, in Mark 14, verse 36, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. And what does Jesus ask the Father before he sees the cross? He says, remove this, what does he say? Cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. See, Jesus even recognizes that going to the cross would be absorbing the cup of wrath from the Father. Now, this is, in fact, what Jesus did do on the cross. That when Jesus went to the cross, he absorbed the wrath of God. So uh, what I want to tell you this morning is as we see images of Jesus on the cross, if we've seen movies, maybe you've seen the Passion of the Christ, and all these different images that we've seen of Jesus, and we think about the, the horrifying images that we've seen of the physical pain that Jesus endured for our sin. Yes, those were horrific things, 
But what made the cross so significant and so painful wasn't just the physical pain. It was that Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin, who was sinless in every way, took on the wrath of God for you and for me. That's what made the weight of the cross so significant. That Jesus Christ would absorb the wrath of God for those who would believe in him. That's what Jesus did for us, friend. And that's called, the the theological term for that is called substitutionary atonement. That we should have been on the cross. However, Jesus Christ, who's sinless and perfect, died as a substitute for us. Another way you could say it is Jesus died in our place. That's what that means. He substituted himself for us. He absorbed the wrath of God so that we did not have to. He absorbed the wrath of God that we deserved. That is grace. And friend, if you deny substitutionary atonement you deny the gospel altogether. Because substitutionary atonement, the fact that Jesus Christ would die in our place is essential when it comes to our faith. And here's why. Because all of us are guilty of sin based on God's word. That sin has to be pardoned in order for us to be made right. Us sinners, because of Adam's sin and because our sin, we're sinners. And how can we be made right before a holy God? God would send his son to die in our place. God did this because he would not be just by allowing sinners to be placed in the kingdom of God, to be standing before a holy God in his eternal kingdom forever. We could not pay this debt on our own. There's no righteous works or there's no effort that we can do in order to be justified or made right before God. And so this is why Jesus had to take the cup for us. This is why Jesus, the wrath of God had to be poured out on his own son because we couldn't do it ourselves. This is why John Stott, I love what John Stott, he's a theologian, he says about the substitutionary atonement. He says, each time we look at the cross, Christ seems to say to us, I am here because of you. It is your sin that I am bearing, your cross, your curse that I am suffering, your debt that I am paying, your death that I am dying. This is what Christ did for us who believe, friends. He died in our place. So when that is foundational in the gospel, this is why it's not just enough to say, well, I just believe that Jesus loves me. Well, yeah, you you have to believe that Jesus loves you, but you have to believe that Jesus has atoned for your sin. He died in your place. And this is why I don't think it's just enough. Well, I believe that Jesus died. I believe that he rose from the grave. Yeah, but do you believe that you belong there and he took your place, that the cross of Jesus Christ, it actually applied to you? That the wrath of God was placed there because of your and my sin. Do you believe that it applies to you? Now, it's the irony of this text is that Jesus is talking about the wrath of God being placed upon him. And and interesting is the disciples are saying, yeah, we could do that. We could take that on. Can you do that? Yeah, we can do that. We we can sign up for that. Clearly, they don't understand. Now, the other metaphor they don't understand is he talks about the cup, but he also talks about the baptism. I'll explain what that means. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or baptize, baptize with the baptism which I am baptized. So you have these two ordinances that today we practice. We practice the cup, the the communion. We practice baptism. So what is he saying? Is he talking about his own baptism or is he using baptism as a metaphor? I think this text, based on this text, he's using it as a metaphor. Uh, Because in popular Greek usage, The vocabulary of baptism was used to speak of when you were overwhelmed or by disaster or by danger. So this usage is used, we see it in three different times in the Psalms. The psalmist, when he talks about suffering, he says suffering is like water submerging us or waves submerging us. 
And the phrase is really, we're being baptized through suffering. It's overwhelming us. It's submerging us. Jesus, in this context, is, is using the same way. He's talking about baptism like it's suffering. He's saying, and he's not talking about his bapti- baptism when he was baptized by John the baptizer earlier in Mark. He's actually talking about the suffering that he's currently facing and that he's about to face in Jerusalem. And so in other words, Jesus is saying, I am going to suffer and you, are you able to suffer? Are you able to go through this? And there, there they go again. They say what? Yeah, we're able. Do you know what you're saying, disciples? Do you really think you can take on the wrath of God on your own? Do you really think you can suffer and be persecuted in this way? What Jesus says next is somewhat surprising. Verse 39. And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. So what does Jesus mean by the statement? Does this mean that they're able to take on the wrath of God? Does this mean that they're able to face this type of suffering that he's talking about? Well, let's go a little further. Verse 40. But to sit at my right hand in my or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but is for those whom it has been prepared. Now, this is Jesus, this is the Trinitarian Godhead. This is the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's, that's what makes up who God is. We believe in one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And now he's attributing who sits at the right hand or left hand. He's saying, that's the Father's business. That's not my business. So he's not saying the father's better. He's saying that the father has a different role, and that's the role of the father. Now, verse 42, uh, uh, verse 41, rather. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And you can almost see them, like they're going to the other ten. The other ten are coming up and smacking them back of the head. What are you thinking by asking Jesus this question? And it goes on, 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord, uh, lord it over them. And they, their uh, great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. He's like, this is not how I want my disciples to be. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here we see Jesus making, bringing clarity on what he means when he says they're able to drink the cup and they're able to be baptized with his baptism. Here he's describing how the world seeks glory. Remember the disciples, they're saying, am I going to get to sit on your right or your left? Because that's how the world functions. The world, he says, the Gentiles, they seek glory for their own. They use whatever power and whatever resources they are given to lord over people. But he said, but it will not be so among you. If you're a disciple of Jesus, he's saying, you are not made to lord over people, but you're made to be whatever God has given you, the resources, the gifts, the money, whatever it is that he's given you, he says, you're made to serve. Now, that, notice that contrast with what Jesus says to his disciples earlier, when he tells them that they would drink the same cup and receive the same baptism. When Jesus makes this statement, he's saying, Disciples should have a certain posture of dying to themselves, of denying themselves, of identifying with my death, of identifying with my suffering. And certainly, he's not saying the disciples had the ability to die for the sins of men. That wouldn't make sense based on verse 45. What is 45 or 46? 45, yeah, 45. That he would die as a ransom, ransom for many. This would be Jesus's role, that Jesus would die as a substitute. Jesus saying that disciples that suffer, that would, would suffer and die, and that would be their identity. It's a posture of serving. It's a posture of saying, I don't want glory to come to myself. I want glory to come to Christ and Christ alone. 
John chapter 6, Jesus uses a similar analogy. Jesus had just finished, the, you see the famous scene of the feeding of the 5,000 where Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children, probably somewhere around 30,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Now, what's interesting in that miracle is that the very next day, the crowd comes to find Jesus and they're asking for, for, for more, more food. They're saying, give us more food. And Jesus makes this very uh, rememberable statement that he says, I am the bread of life. And they're like, what do you mean you're the bread of life? And he says, if you feast on me, you'll never grow hungry. They're like, what does that mean? Well, Jesus now makes this statement in the end of John 6 that's even more confusing, all right, to the crowd. John 6, 53, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, if you're ever sharing the gospel with someone, don't start with these verses, all right? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, you should eat his flesh and drink his blood, all right? That's what it means. What is Jesus saying here when he makes this statement? Is he saying literally eat his flesh and drink his blood? Well, certainly not. He's speaking again metaphorically, and he's using the same language of, that we would use when we take communion, eat the flesh and drink the blood. What does he mean? He's saying, I want real followers of me to identify with me through my death and my suffering, through the body that was going to be broken and through the blood that's going to be shed. That's how you know that you belong to me because you believe that I have died and shed blood for you. That's what it means to identify with Jesus. He's saying it's all about identifying with his death and his suffering. Now, Jesus in Mark 10 is saying the same thing to his disciples. You must eat, you must drink of the cup and be baptized with my baptism. He's saying you got to identify with my death and my suffering. That's what it means to follow me. Ironically, the two men who were asking Jesus' this question, James, beaten to death for following Christ. After Jesus' death and resurrection, James followed Jesus and died by identifying with the suffering and even identified him to his very death. You even see John, who wasn't martyred for the faith, but he definitely identified with Jesus' suffering. And he was boiled in a huge basin of oil. He survived, but he spent the rest of his life making much of King Jesus. You see, Peter, the disciple of Jesus, who would have heard these very words, Peter lived a life of suffering. Peter was crucified upside down. He identified with Jesus' suffering and his death. Matthew, disciple of Jesus, killed by a sword wound. And the list goes on of disciples and apostles who followed Jesus, people in the early church who followed Jesus, Mark, who wrote the gospel of Mark, dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. Luke, who, the medical doctor who wrote the gospel of Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was hanged. James, the half-brother of Jesus, beheaded. Bartholomew, beaten to death. Andrew, crucified, preached for two days as he was crucified until he breathed his last breath. Thomas, stabbed with a spear. Jude, killed with arrows. Matthias, who was the apostle who was chosen after Judas Iscariot uh, was, betrayed Jesus. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. And then Barnabas was stoned to death. And the list goes on. All died identifying with the death of Jesus and his suffering. All lived sacrificially for the sake of the gospel all lived as servants. Why? Because they didn't want to glorify themselves. They wanted to glorify Christ and Christ alone. Friends, this call of discipleship, of sacrifice, of drinking the cup that he drank, of baptized in the baptism in which he was baptized, is still the call to us today. That means that if we're going to be true disciples of Jesus, we should have the posture 
of being a servant for our king. We have the posture of saying, I'm willing to suffer for Jesus. I'm willing to die for Jesus. How often do we forget that's our call? How often we forget that, Jesus, this is what it means to deny ourselves. That we will say less of me and more of him. Well, just like the disciples, we're prone to forget. And so what do we have? Well, the church, we have reminders. We have symbols. We have rituals that we do to help remind ourselves of the call to be Jesus' disciples. So let's talk about some of them. First of all, we have baptism. And I said you get into a feeding trough and you are submerged underwater and you come back up and everyone claps. So what does that mean? Well, baptism is a sign that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. It's just like for me, I wear this wedding band. This is not the original wedding band. This is like a piece of rubber at this point, but that's what they have become these days. Um, and it doesn't make me, I'm not unmarried if I take this off. I'm, I'll wear it because I'm married. Baptism is a symbol, just like this ring is a symbol that I belong to Jess Tugwell forever. Baptism is saying, I belong to Jesus forever. And not only is it just a commitment that you're making at that moment, because scripture commands it, and scripture says that believers should do it. It says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you who are followers of Jesus, publicly declare Jesus. And you going up under the water is, is a symbol of your death, that you've died to yourself. And you coming up out of the water is to represent your new life. It's a symbol to say that you have a new heart and you're transformed by the gospel. Every single person who is a believer in Jesus Christ should be baptized. So if you haven't, we have one coming up on September 15th. You can sign up online. Uh, there, you can fill out a connection card even this morning and let us know. We would love for you uh, to walk through that step, and we'd love to hear your story and love for you to be baptized because we believe that it's biblical, and we believe that it's a symbol not just for the people that are being baptized, but it's a symbol for every single one of the people in this room that I have this commitment to make. It's like going to a wedding and you hear vows and you're like, man, I need to, I, I, I'm, I suck as a husband. I need to do something, right? I'm hearing these vows and man, I've got to do something. Every time you go to a wedding, you see that symbol, you're challenged and you're challenged at this commitment that you made. It's the same thing with baptism. Not only does it bless the person that's there because they're walking in obedience, but it, it encourages the church who are there and it challenges them to the commitment they're making because the commitment they're making is not just one of standing out and saying, yes, I want to publicly declare my faith, but it's like I'm willing to suffer for the gospel. I'm willing to suffer for the gospel. I'm willing to deny myself. I'm willing to take up my cross and follow him. That's why we have this symbol, and that's why it's so important. That's why in integrity, we, we don't baptize people that can't articulate the gospel that can't show life change, which would include infants. We, we don't baptize infants because we, they can't articulate the gospel. They can't show a true heart change because we believe the New Testament, it's followed by belief. And so if you're a believer in Christ and, and you haven't been baptized, man, let me just encourage you. Your baptism is a public declaration that you're willing to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And not only is it encouragement for you to walk in that, but it's also encouragement for so many other people. Then we also have this other symbol that Jesus talks about, and that's the Lord's Supper. For believers in Christ, the church has been practicing both baptism and, and the Lord's Supper since it began. Over 2,000 years, the church has done these things. That Jesus said in, in his last supper that we would take the bread and we would drink the cup to remember him. And so when you take the bread and you take the cup, you're identifying with Jesus' death. You are actually saying that I believe in substitutionary atonement. I don't know if you knew that or not. Congratulations. You have a theological term that says every time you walk up, you've said, I believe that Jesus Christ died in my place. And I believe that there's nothing I could do to save myself. Every time you come to the table and you take the bread and you take the cup, you're saying, that is my identity. 
that Christ Jesus has died in my place. And because of that, I am a brand new person. And I don't live for me anymore. I live for Christ. That's what that means. And this is why the the table actually reminds us of who we are in him. And not only that, but it reminds us of our position before him. It says, because I identify with Jesus' death, I also am called to live my life as a servant. And so then you have this question that you ask before you come to the table. This is why it's a chance to examine your heart, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, that you now have the opportunity to say, am I really living as a servant? Am I a servant to my spouse? Am I a servant to my children? Am I a servant to my coworkers? Am I a servant to my roommates or my dorm mates? Am I a servant to my classmates? Am I a servant to my neighbors? Am I a servant with the way I spend my money? Am, am I showing that I really am a servant to, to my king? Do, do I really walk in repentance? Am I hiding sin or am I walking in repentance and obeying my king? Every single time we come to the table, we remind ourselves that he came not to serve uh, not, to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then we ask ourselves the question, am I walking in that light? Am I really identifying with his death? Church, we have incredible ways that we can respond. These symbols mean something. They're to remind us to celebrate Jesus. And when we understand what they mean, we become better worshipers of him. And so this morning, if I could plead with you, would you take advantage of what we have before us? Would we sing for his glory? Would we give for his glory? Would we take communion by allowing the Holy Spirit to search us and to challenge us to live our lives that identify sacrificially as a servant for Jesus? Would we take the next step for you, maybe you haven't been baptized. Maybe you need to take the next step and be baptized. Maybe for you this morning, you need to take it the next step and become a believer. You need to repent of your sins and trust that Jesus died in your place. Perhaps the Lord would do that this morning. So what a privilege we have this morning, church, to worship him. And may God use this time of responding to him in a way that brings him glory. God help us. Let's pray.